I would like to uh, present some recent results I've obtained with Sebastian Reich on supervised learning for noisy observations. Um, and uh, the general objective uh, we're addressing in this talk is the following. So we're given a dynamical system, uh, u dot is f of u, uh, but we only have information about the system through observations uh, at discrete times at tn. Uh, so superscript O is for observations, um, and they are contaminated by noise um, that we assume it to be Gaussian uh, uh, distributed. And associated with that flow is a propagator map, uh, Psi, uh, for a time step delta T that gets us from Tn uh, to Tn plus one, and that propagates Un to Un plus one. And so the uh, objective we are, we are setting ourselves is to find a surrogate uh, a model for this propagator to learn this propagator just from observations here and the observations are supposed to be noisy. Um, so there is, um, there is a, a classical framework to do that in machine learning uh, that's called random feature maps. So as an input we want u of t and as the output we want u of t plus delta t and the way this is done in classical random feature maps is through these random features that, so we embed the data in a high dr dimensional space that is uh, much larger than d. Um, and uh, these uh, uh, random features are called random feature because the internal uh, parameters w in and b in, they are fixed but random. So they're randomly drawn from some distribution and they map, so w in maps the input ut to some rd dimensional uh, uh, vector. And then um, in random feature maps, the, the, these uh, random features are then uh, linearly combined to produce uh, the output at time t plus uh, delta t. So uh, this is a very simple setup in the sense that um, what we're learning, these uh, linear, uh, co uh, the, the coefficients of these linear combinations of these random feature maps, we can now um, determine uh, using linear regression. And uh, so this uh, is the talk in one slide here uh, that I'm presenting. Um, so uh, the title already said we combine uh, machine learning, so classical random feature maps with uh, data simulation. So in data simulation, uh, we have the following setup. We're given a forecast um, and we're given observations. We don't trust either of them. The forecast uh, we don't trust because we may have some model error um, it, if it's a chaotic system, then there's sensitivity uh, with respect to initial conditions. And since we don't know the in, in initial conditions uh, uh, perfectly, um, we can't trust our forecast. And uh, so in data simulation, those two noisy pieces of information, the forecast and the observations are combined in what's called an analysis um, that's uh, given here as uh, the forecast plus some weighted uh, uh, um, some weighting of the of the difference between the forecast and the observations. Here I assume that uh, we have full observation, we observe all variables. And then this analysis, this sort of optimal um, estimate for the current state is then used as uh, the initial condition for another forecast with the forecast model curly M uh, that maps now um, the analysis to the next for um, uh, uh, the forecast at the next uh, time step. And um, I said this is the, uh, the talk in one slide. So what we're going to do is, um, oops, sorry, is um, we're going to replace this forecast model by the random feature model here. And we're going to learn the, uh, the W, those, um, those parameters uh, um, um, of the random, random feature model, we learn them sequentially within that data assimilation procedure. So this is, this is the whole idea. Um, and um, we're gonna do the following. So first I'm gonna tell you a little bit more background on random feature maps and how we combine them um, in, in, uh, with data simulation. And that's what we call this random feature map with data simulation or RAFTA. And then I'm gonna show you some numerical um, results illustrating how, how well it works. And we start with Lorenz 63, where we can study various dependencies, the size of uh, um, the DR, the size of what we call the reservoir, uh, the size of the training data, um, the noise strings and, um, uh, and other uh, um, 
uh, other dependencies. And we're also going to look into uh, how, if we can use those ensembles um, or ensembles generated by Rafter in an ensemble forecasting setting. I'm going to present you just one slide on uh, kuramoto zivashinsky equation, um, how well we can um, learn the dynamics uh, for PDE. And then uh, we finish with a multi-scale Lorentz 96 system where we can use this rafter to uh, perform some model closure for, for the slow dynamics. So uh, let's start with um, just a brief um, description of uh, classical random feature maps. So in classical random feature maps, the, the aim is we have a function f and we want to approximate it as a linear combination of these random features that are parameterized by random parameters theta j, they're random but fixed iid parameters. And the aim is to learn these linear coefficients wj. We can set this up with some cost function where we measure the difference of this approximation and the function we want to approximate. Uh, and we have some regularization, so we use uh, rich regression here. And then um, the, the, the solution uh, is given by the linear regression solution here. Uh, that where we have this regularization beta uh, in here. <coughs> and um, there is some uh, theory, which is very nice uh, about these random feature maps. So um, these random feature maps, you can define a kernel and associated with that kernel is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And there exists some universal approximation theorem. Um, so that tells us that these, uh, um, that we can arbitrarily closely approximate continuous functions using those random features. So this RKHS is dense in the space of uh, uh, continuous functions. And typical random features uh, um, that, that people use are the ReLU function and the Tench function. Um, here we use the Tench function uh, for our numerical illustrations. Um, and um, this is again this, uh, um, this sort of, uh, sketch or the schematic of the, the setup here. So um, we're going to use these random features now uh, to learn the dynamics that maps us from u of t to u of t plus delta t. So we're going to learn those w's. Um, so a couple of remarks. Um, when we learn these w's, we do this with linear uh, regression. So that means we're actually using the entire data set. So it's not sequentially done. Um, then, um, although there is this universal approximation theorem um, available, it doesn't actually tell us um, how to choose those random parameters w in and b in. What are good choices for those? Um, that is not covered by the uh, by the theorem, um, and a particular random choice might actually give you a bad uh, approximation of the function that you're trying to uh, to approximate. Uh, there's a connection to echo state networks or reservoir computing where um, we have some additional internal dynamics here um, um, on those uh, random features. Um, but in our simulations, we found that that was not necessary. Um, so we uh, keep entirely with those, um, those classical random features here. Um, a drawback of uh, random feature models is that they're sensitive to noise. Um, so People use it typically when the model is known and you have access to, uh, to, to perfect data. There's a positive aspect uh, of this here that we're going to use, which is that it's very easily uh, to embed classical random feature uh, as in data simulation. And that's what I'm going to present now. Um, so um, the idea is to combine the random feature map architecture with data in the data simulation procedure. And we want to learn the coefficients of the linear combinations of these random feature maps sequentially. And uh, we update it with the incoming observations. So um, this is a little cartoon of how data simulation works. So we're given a forecast model that produces a forecast at time ti. At ti, we have an observation. We combine the two in this uh, uh, data simulation procedure. We get the analysis that we use then as the initial condition for the next forecast where again, we get a new observation, we get uh, produce a new analysis and so forth. So this is, this is a sequential um, procedure. Um, and um, the idea we're gonna uh, use here <coughs> is to, 
to uh, um, replace this forecast model that's, uh, uh, by the random feature model. And then the uh, learn the parameters W for the random feature model uh, inside this uh, data assimilation procedure. And um, so um, the, 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 the problem that we're encountering now, if we include those in, in the state, if we, addition, in addition to the state uh, variables U that we assimilate to produce our analysis, also uh, include the parameters is that the, um, that the estimation problem becomes now nonlinear. Um, and the way we uh, do this um, a combined random feature map and data simulation procedure is about follows. So we replace the forecast model by the random feature model. And we assimilate as well the, um, the, the parameters uh, of, the, of the random feature model. Uh, the ones that we want to learn. Um, so we're learning this model on the fly, and um, there are uh, 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 these are these W's in here. So they're parameters, so they're they're fixed uh, for the forecast, uh, and then we're given also our observations. And um, the way we do this uh, combined parameter and state space uh, estimation is. Uh, so an, an augmented state space. So we augment our state space. So this is the classical state space assimilation, but now we augment it by W, where W is just the long vector uh, consisting of the rows, small w, of the rows of uh, um, our uh, matrix capital W. So the dimension is now D for the state plus D times DR for the uh, elements, uh, small w, inside that big W matrix we have here. And we're going to use a Kalman filter update um, where H is our observation operator. So H on this augmented state space, we only observe the U. We do not observe the, the parameters. These are the, the parameters we want to learn. And we have the Kalman gain matrix here that involves um, the forecast covariance matrix. That is now the um, covariance matrix so of, the, of the deviations of all the Zs, so it includes the covariances of the state space, but also includes cross uh, covariances of state and uh, parameters and just the uh, uh, covariances of the parameters. Um, so this is very high dimensional forecast covariance uh, matrix. Um, and the way we are um, gonna implement these, um, this Kalman filter update is uh, in the setting of ensemble Kalman filters. So in ensemble Kalman filters, we have an ensemble of uh, uh, states, states based on ensemble of, um, uh, of particles uh, from one to M. And uh, each ensemble member is now uh, updated um, with the Kalman, uh, Kalman filter. So this is the Kalman uh, gain matrix here, uh, now in, in its full glory. Uh, and uh, these are the increments. So why are ensemble Kalman filters uh, attractive? Because they give, us, um, they give us access to this forecast covariance by just the simple Monte Carlo uh, estimate through having an ensemble. So we're not just propagating forecasting one uh, a trajectory, but we forecast an ensemble of those trajectories. And that allows us to give an estimate on the, um, on the forecast covariance uh, matrix. So now we have all the ingredients here are now given uh, on the right hand side to create our uh, analysis at, uh, at the next, next time step. Um, so for, to um, have uh, uh, the ensemble Kalman filter um, converge properly, um, where properly, by the way, doesn't mean it converges to the correct solution for nonlinear problems. It converges, but um, it uh, does not converge to the uh, exact true solution uh, if the uh, model is nonlinear. Um, so um, for it to work, we need it to be roughly of the order of dz, um, which is too high. That would be too, too expensive to have that many, um, um, many uh, ensemble members because we need large for the classical random feature maps, we need a large DR, we need a large reservoir size. So we have finite size effects that we need to deal with. Um, uh, one is that if the ensemble is too small, uh, what one observes is that these, uh, some of those, uh, or the, the, this finite ensemble, they may just follow 
the same trajectory for some time that suggests through this forecast covariance matrix here, which would then be small, that um, we will not update. So then this, this term here will be small. So the analysis will be basically the forecast. So we're not corrected by incoming new observations. And that is an unstable process where you in, in effect just have a free running, um, a free running forecast. So uh, that will never be corrected by the, um, by the observations. So we lose all the, um, all the advantage of a data simulation procedure. Uh, and a classic way to uh, deal with this is to infl what's called inflation, where we multiply this PF by some constant factor larger than one. Um, that seems here for our, uh, for the experiments we've done here, not so important. However, what is important is localization. Um, so another finite size effect is um, we may have state variables that um, are not correlated uh, with each other or have very small correlations. So um, think of a spatial system and they're uh, spatially far away, then you have very, my, may have very small uh, connect, uh, correlations between those two um, um, variables. Um, However, when you now try a finite uh, a size uh, estimate of this covariance matrix, you have an order of, uh, one on square root of uh, M um, error, which um, then suggests that they, these variables are uh, correlated. So um, the way we implement this here is to, to kill off those, those spurious correlations that are finite size induced. Um, that for us also means a huge computational advantage is we observe that if we uh, take our W phi, um, then the J's row of this W will affect only the U of J at N plus one. So uh, we then neglect all correlations between the parameters W or the, the, uh, the rows of W um, with all uh, other, um, other components of U that are not J. So uh, this is uh, our localization procedure. And let's now see how that um, works out for the Lorenz 63 system. So this is Lorenz 63. Uh, these are just some parameters that we chose for the reservoir size and um, for the uh, size of the ensemble. So by setting them uh, uh, roughly the same, we eliminate a lot of the finite size effects. And um, then uh, we have a training set of length n. And then uh, what we want to do is we learn our model now on uh, links on, on this training set. And then we have another trajectory that we uh, you valid for which we do, uh, for which we test our forecast uh, skills of, of the model. And uh, we quantify the forecast uh, skill by uh, measuring the forecast horizon. So this is the largest time such that the relative error of um, the truth of this, this validation time series and our estimate here um, at time n t n uh, in the validation set um, is less than 5%. Okay, so, and we're gonna measure, by the way, we're gonna measure all the times are now measured in uh, Lyapunov times. Um, so to, um, to get a kind of, uh, more physical understanding of what, what one time unit means. Uh, the first thing we uh, address is the choice of the internal parameters of the random feature maps. So uh, the random feature maps have these um, internal parameters, W in, B in, that are drawn randomly and then kept fixed. And so we draw them here from uh, a uniform distribution between minus W and plus W and minus B and plus B. And what's shown here, uh, the color coding is the forecast, uh, um, the forecast horizon, TF. So uh, yellow means you can forecast eight Lyapunov times now. Um, so there's some structure in here as, uh, for W and for B. This is for um, eta equal to zero. This is for noisy data. And this is just using, um, using um, uh, uh, classical random feature maps. There's no data assimilation uh, uh, involved in here. This is just to understand uh, uh, the role of those parameters. Um, so it's quite sensitive uh, to noise, um, this, this picture. It's also quite sensitive to um, particular choices. So even if you're in a, in a range here, 
um, um, that gives you good, um, uh, that's kind of mainly yellow, you may still pick uh, a bad parameter value that uh, doesn't give you good, um, doesn't give you good um, uh, forecast skills. So how do good and bad parameters look like? Um, so um, here you see the, 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 what I plot here is the argument uh, or, or the random features of, of phi of uh, um, w in times u plus b. And you see a bad one is where we, we're not exploring the, the, the tang function for minus one to plus one. We are all in the plateau here. Um, we, um, all those parameters give us for each u um, from the attractor here of, um, of, of, of the Lorentz system, <coughs> uh, concentrate as a minus one and plus one. Another bad one would be if we were concentrated at zero, because then we basically had a linear, um, uh, the random feature map would just be a linear function, um, which, which we know is not a good, um, good way to approximate our, um, our propagator. Uh, good ones, however, are those that explore the bits of the tang function that are nonlinear. Um, so this is just an illustration um, how um, how these parameters uh, uh, b in and w in affect the forecast capabilities of of, of classical random feature maps. Um, so we're going to use um, for the for the simulation that I'm going to show you for the Lorentz system. We're going to choose uh, parameters up here. Um, that work for noise and for um, for a noisy data and for um, uh, for noiseless data uh, reasonably well. Um, then uh, another thing we may want to look at is uh, what's the dependency of the forecast horizon of the initial ensemble of the inner parameters. So um, we have um, we have to choose our uh, uh, of um, we have to choose our um, initial ensemble for the parameters, oops, sorry, uh, w, uh, w naught. And we can do this in two ways. We can be unbiased. We can say we have no uh, prior information uh, and then uh, generate an ensemble for the, the parameters at um, um, uh, to, to generate some spread. Or we could say uh, we um, center the uh, initial uh, uh, parameters uh, at some um, at, at the solution that's given by classical random feature map. So, um, and if we do this, this is gamma, um, the the uh, the spread here of our initial ensemble. Of course, those two methods will be for large gamma will be roughly the same because if we heat up the ensemble so much with large gammas, then it doesn't really matter where we centered it. Um, and uh, this is the uh, classical uh, um, um, uh, um, linear regression solution for, for uh, random feature maps. And there's a, there's a reasonably large um, range in gamma that um, allows us to, to get good um, forecast horizons. Okay, so um, let's look at the dependency of the reservoir dimension. So here we see we have um, we have saturation, so if the reservoir is uh, sufficiently large, then um, there is no gain, not much gain uh, um, uh, uh, um, achieved by uh, increasing the reservoir dimension. Um, here is a histogram for the um, forecast uh, uh, horizon tor, again in, uh, in Yapunov times. Um, for classical and blue L, uh, linear regression and for our rafter um, scheme. So we have increased um, forecast capabilities uh, if we now estimate the, um, the forecast model sequentially using, um, using data simulation rather than using all the data at once uh, in classical random features. So here's a factor, more than a factor of two is the, the difference here. Um, Similarly, uh, the dependency on the length of the training data set, um, uh, there's also saturation here. Uh, and here you see this, this increase in forecast capabilities of uh, um, if we do the learning sequentially using data simulation. Um, then um, we can look at the dependency of the measurement noise. Um, so um, <coughs> if the measurement noise is too large, we lose all capability to forecast. 
um, there is an exponential decay here um, for the for the rafter model that's sort of consistent with the um, sensitivity to initial conditions uh, in chaotic systems. Um, so if we have more noise in our um, we kind of it's like changing the initial conditions and, and we will have exponential separation of nearby trajectories and uh, that is how we explain this uh, exponential decay here uh, and then we have um, we have um, <clears throat> uh, we have saturation here um, for both models to to some plateau if the noise strings uh, get smaller um, so We've just shown that we can good forecast uh, capabilities for uh, for a single single forecast, um, but in um, lots of applications, for example, in weather, in uh, numerical weather forecasting, um, a single forecast is not really meaningful, and people would like a probabilistic forecast. Um, so where you're not just given uh, a mean, but you could give them some uh, mean forecast, but also some uh, measure of the uncertainty of the forecast. How much do we trust that mean? Moreover, a mean may not actually be uh, a meaningful um, forecast if you have a bimodal uh, distribution that's uh, uh, this with a disjoint, uh, disjoint distribution, then the mean may not even be physical, um, physically attainable state. So the way we uh, do this in ensemble forecasting is we let an ensemble uh, propagate an ensemble, and that gives us some Monte Carlo estimate of the um, of the densities. And so this is an, uh, a way to um, get a probabilistic forecast through an ensemble. And um, the idea now how we going to use Rafter to produce such an ensemble forecast is we will use Rafter now as our forecast model within a data assimilation procedure. So we train Rafter first, then the Rafter model and all the parameters are fixed. And we use this fixed Rafter model now as a surrogate model for within a new independent data assimilation procedure on new data. And uh, we compare um, now, um, I said, so the, the, the mean is not really meaningful uh, as much and, and not such an interesting object for those uh, ensemble forecasts and, and to decide if your ensemble um, is, 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 is a good ensemble. So uh, people speak of uh, reliable ensembles where reliability uh, um, in loose terms is telling that uh, what you want is that each ensemble member has uh, equal probability to be closest to the truth. And one way to probe for um, this reliability is for our continuous rank probability scores, CRPS, that measures the um, sort of the, the closeness of your cumulative distribution function given by your ensemble to the step function uh, cumulative probability distribution of the truth. Uh, because it's a truth, it's, uh, the, the CDF is now a step function. Uh, it's zero until you hit the actual U, and then you know it was a U, so it's one. So it uh, measures this, um, this distance. And um, so it has a negative orientation, so small CRPS is good, uh, large CRPS is bad. And you see here linear regressions or classical random feature uh, uh, models do not produce a good, uh, reliable ensemble. Um, whereas Rafter does um, very well, and it even beats uh, classical ensemble Kalman filter ensembles uh, on long times. It has kind of up to one year point of time, um, similar reliability, similar CRPS, and then it is smaller, so it is better for larger uh, for larger forecast times. Um, so uh, let's go to an infinite dimensional system. Let's go to the Kromo to the Wachinsky equation, where we now train on noisy observations. Um, so uh, classical random feature maps is, um, does not produce a good, um, a good forecast here at all. We get maximal like one year of time. Rafter here, without too much um, tuning uh, of the internal parameters here, uh, gives us a forecast time of, this is the the error here um, of the rafter uh, forecast and the, the truth. Um, so for roughly three to four uh, Lyapunov times here. Okay, so last um, application 
is now can we use RevTuff um, to determine uh, closure models. Um, so the setting um, here is a multi-scale Lorentz 96 model. So uh, we have slower variables x and y where um, x and y being slow and fast is determined by the size of uh, c and b uh, and, uh, and d, those parameters here. <coughs> um, so we have a classical Lorentz uh, system here. So there's forcing, linear damping. There is an advective term. Um, so x describes these variables here. They're down circle. So there, there's a, it's a periodic ring. Um, and then each of those variables, capital X, are coupled to lots of those small y's that have the same, uh, that also have an, um, an advection term, a damping term, and they're also driven by the, the slow variable <coughs> X here. So this is a, a waterfall plot time here, and this is space one, two, three, four, up to eight. Uh, and we see there's a wave structures moving in time here and slave by those wave structures are those fast evolving Y variables um, along here. And the aim of closure uh, of the closure problem is now to replace this term here that would require us to solve the full stiff multi-scale system, so computationally very expensive, um, by a term that only depends on the resolved uh, slow x variable. So this is now a closed system for uh, capital X um, that is not stiff anymore so we can use larger time steps if we want to propagate it. So that's the, the computational advantage why people are interested in these closures. And uh, the capital G is just um, this part here um, of the, uh, the deterministic kind of part here of the, or the, the, the slow part of the, um, of the vector field of the slow variables. Um, so we assume that um, if we do this closure that we have some kind of good understanding of um, the resolved part of the, um, the vector, vector field. Okay, so um, this is an old problem. People have done uh, a lot of research on those and uh, we're gonna do here a, a deterministic um, approximation of this um, or parameterization of this, uh, uh, this term here. Um, people have done this before, so um, starting with Wilkes, they, uh, they've done a quartic approximation to data. Um, and there's uh, Arnold, Moros, and Palmer. They um, did it on a cubic, um, uh, with, with a cubic polynomial. And what we're going to try here is now use Grafter to learn this closure terms. And we learn it by observing an approximation to the derivative here by our finite differencing of the observations xn and xn minus one. And we have, we're given, um, um, uh, 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 we, we're given x uh, at n and we know we have a good understanding of this uh, uh, g. So we assume we know this, uh, uh, this deterministic, uh, sorry, th this uh, resolved part of the vector field g. So these are now, this is how we construct our observa observations to uh, estimate Psi. Okay, um, a remark here, if we were to do this uh, just with classical random features, because we want to learn it from noisy observations, um, so we're not given a model here, all those, those approximations here, they were done by having full access to the model. So you know your, your, um, your variables. Um, so if we were to take a noisy uh, observations, then um, this is a very bad uh, estimator. Okay, so <coughs> uh, what's plotted here that in gray are um, results from a, a numerical simulation, a long time series of the full multi-scale model. So you see it's not really deterministic. There's a whole scatter around here. So stochastic uh, uh, approximation is, is, uh, seems more appropriate. Um, uh, but here the aim was to try and use it with a deterministic uh, approximation. And I show you here results for, uh, in blue, this is linear regression, but only, so linear regression had, had the advantage here in this, that we, um, uh, uh, um, we learned linear regression on noise-free data, whereas all the others, uh, and, and LR, uh, sorry, Wilkes and Arnold were also using noise-free data, whereas Rafter used actually noisy data. Uh, 
And <clears throat> here's a histogram so, um, of the truth and of the rafter of a validation set. So where we learned this psi, the closure term, and then uh, propagate this reduced model with this estimated psi. Um, and um, so it, it's very close. And we can also look at the um, relative error of the mean and the variance um, of the time series uh, and uh, compare to linear regression to um, the uh, polynomial um, approximations by Wilkes and Arnold et al. Um, and um, raft that is better on me on both of both of those uh, statistical um, quantities. Okay, so this concludes uh, uh, the talk. So we've used Rafter here um, to determine reduced closure models that we can use then those closure models themselves um, to um, replace the, the expensive multi-scale model. And um, this is in a setting where we don't know the full model, it's not available and we only have um, uh, only available um, observations of the resolved variables. And um, so what have we done? We have developed a combined random feature map and data simulation methodology to learn models from noisy observations and to learn uh, the model sequentially. Um, then um, we've shown that we can get an increased forecast horizon in both for ODEs and PDEs. Um, then um, we also uh, showed that uh, we can use those um, surrogate models that uh, we trained as um, forecast models for um, cheap forecast models um, for an, um, uh, um, to generate uh, probabilistic forecasts. So we showed that we generate reliable ensembles um, with our procedure. Um, and then we showed that we can use it um, for deterministic closure models uh, when the model isn't known and we only have noisy observations of the resolved variables. And um, so these are promising results and um, we now like to uh, extend this. Um, so uh, on the methodological side, uh, an extension would be to find also simultaneously the internal parameters, the ones that we fixed uh, and where we could end up with a bad draw um, that will give us bad forecast horizons. So can we estimate good forecast, uh, uh, sorry, can we estimate those internal parameters on the fly as well? Um, then uh, for the stochastic subgrid scale parameterization, so for the closure model, um, the next step would be, can we learn a stochastic process um, using RAFTA sequentially? Um, here, all those results uh, are presented. They used um, access to the full state space. So an obvious question is, um, can we do this and how well can we do this uh, with partial observations? And there are many more applications, model error and, and so forth. Um, so there's lots to do for us and I'm looking forward to any comments and questions. Thank you.